Hey, Garage Gym Athletes, before we get to the show, I wanted to check to see if you knew that we are on YouTube. We've been on the platform for a while, but only more recently started to get serious about some video content. So while the podcast will meet most of your needs, some things simply need a visual explanation. So if you want more on concurrent training, programming, Garage Gyms, head over to YouTube, search Garage Gym Athlete, and subscribe to the channel. I look forward to connecting with you on another platform. All right, let's get to the show. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Garage Gym Athlete Podcast. Jared Moon here with Joe Courtney. What's up, Joe? How's it going, man? It's going pretty good. Happy New Year, 2023. Yes. This is is our first actual recording in the new year, right? As far as I know. Yeah. First study. First study of the new year. First everything of the new year. So happy 2023. Hopefully everyone's chasing some some goals, and uh, we'll update you guys more as we go along in 2023. Uh, today, we're going over a study. Um, so it is actually an older study, uh, but the I, I thought it was really cool, and I get questions about um, different types of sauna all the time, so I wanted to do a sauna study. So this one was completed in 2013, and the title of the study is Effect of a Single Finish Sauna Session on white blood cell profile and cortisol levels in athletes and non-athletes. And that last little part there of the study is the most interesting part to me is that they differentiated athletes and non-athletes um, and what the uh, the effect of the sauna would be. And I, I just f- find that super interesting because, you know, some like they don't normally do that when, like if it's a leg exercise, right? They're just like, they either go with trained athletes did it or they go with untrained athletes did it. They don't normally compare the two. And most of the time, that's what we want to see. But I wouldn't even think to do it in a sauna study. So I think that's the probably the coolest part about this. Um, so what did they do? Man, they measured a lot of stuff. So they had nine trained middle distance runners and nine male non-athletes. Uh, So they did a 15-minute sauna session until their core temperature rose by 1.2 degrees Celsius, uh, which I think is interesting, something to note. Um, And the mean temperature in the sauna was 96 degrees plus or minus 2, and that is Celsius, which is like 200, over 200 degrees Fahrenheit. So really hot, like a very hot sauna. Um, And the humidity was 15 plus or minus 3%. And then they do a two minute cool down uh, with water, like in water. And uh, the temperature of the water was 19 to 20 degrees Celsius, which is like in the high 60s. Like 60, yeah. yeah. So like not a not crazy cold water. I mean, that's cool, but it's not like it's not like jumping in a, in a cold plunge or an ice bath or anything. It's really just cool water, like, uh, you know, a, a cold Texas shower in the middle of summer, maybe 68 degrees, something like that. Um, and they they monitored if you're like, well, how'd they take their body temperature? Glad you asked because it was rectal rectal temperature was monitored at five minute intervals during the entire session. Um, so I don't know, not the most comfortable of studies. (laughs) (laughs) I I don't, they didn't truly like, I didn't get if there was just a rectal thermometer in the whole time and they took the readings at every five minutes or every five minutes they would come into the sauna for a, uh, rectal. I reading. hope there's some sort of like Bluetooth, like, Hey, you put this where you need to, and we'll just <sighs> monitor. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. This is 2013. Did Bluetooth even exist? I'm kidding. It definitely, <laughs> definitely did. But, um, but the, the good thing is a uh, rectal temperature is like the most accurate. So again, I know that's why they were wanting to do that. And I think if you just measure, measured someone's forehead, I'll have to do this in my sauna. Like, I think if I hopped out and you measured my forehead temperature, I would definitely have a fever. Like it would say I was like, you know, super hot, like way, way hotter than my actual core temperature would be just because of how hot the uh, the air gets in there. Um, so anyway, that was most of like how it worked. Very simple. But what they measured, they um, measured a lot of different stuff. Serum total protein. Um, they were checking cortisol levels. They were looking at... Uh, body mass loss through plasma volume. Um, then they were looking at white blood cells, lymphocytes, neutrophils, basophils, 
all the counts of those, which are all just different types of immune cells. Um, and that's about it. Most everything was related to like immune system cell in the blood and uh, cortisol levels. So that was, that was a study. Um, before we get into like the results of the study, did you think did you find anything interesting in, in the study itself, like how it was broken down or, or performed? Yeah. So the very first thing I wrote down was the athletes versus non-athletes, which we've, we'd never see, but I think it's kind of cool that they did that, especially doing a non fitness type, um, assessment. So on saunas, anybody can do the sauna. It's not like you're doing anything for performance. There's not like a strength thing. So that was cool to see. And I'm, I'm curious as to why, like, I, don't, I didn't really, I don't think I saw why they decided to go athlete for not non-athlete, um, or the aim completely as to what brought this on, but it was, it was definitely cool to see. Uh, when I first read the abstract, it seemed, oh, hey, sauna is super great. It does great stuff. But the more I read, the more, I guess, confused or skeptical I, I became about certain things that they looked at, like um, what, like how, how big of a, uh, how big of an effect, how big of a, a deal is what they found. And you might be able to shine some light on some things like cortisol they looked at. And I didn't see that there was much of a, um, like the m much of a, of a greater difference, like they're the years uh, in athlete versus non-athlete or either way, the cortisol went up because it's your stress ho hormone. Um, the, I think the non-athletes, it got higher, but that's about it. Like there's where I think there was already higher to begin with. And um, other, other things to note, it was kind of funny when, cause also when you look at it, it's, you know, athlete, middle distance runners versus non-athlete, then you go through and their definition of non-athlete is somebody that still does fitness twice a week, which I think is pretty funny. And I mean, in a good I, I way, agree like, with that definition. Yeah. That's a non-athlete. That's a <laughs> I, recreational I, fitness enthusiast. I, I, yeah, I guess it's not like a, what, what do we normally get? Just non-active or whatever. I guess, well, I mean, yeah. Cause probably. the people that were the athletes, they're not like, Oh, this person works out. Like these are middle distance runners. Like they're, they're very fit, like very fit individuals. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I think that was, that was kind of how they're breaking it down. I mean, to be honest in this study, they might consider us non-athletes. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um, but then uh, the last thing was that was kind of, kind of interesting, noteworthy because there's been other studies, I guess, done on it is that the threshold for the cortisol being increased is at 38 degrees Celsius rectal temperature. And they were at 39 for this. So I guess they, they designed it so that it's just over, uh, what, what they found to, to see what the, the rise in cortisol was. But, um, it got me also wondering, like when you work out, I wonder, I wonder what the, your in, internal temperature is and like what that would be fitness wise, like during different workouts, how your internal temperature could affect cortisol just for training sessions, like resistance or, um, uh, conditioning and, and stuff. So it just got my mind wandering about a few things, but, uh, if you just want to go to the, I guess, results of it, those are just there, but yeah, overall the results and takeaway. Um, let's see. They actually had a nice little conclusion piece to this study. Uh, here it is. So the conclusions were sauna bathing with a body cool down causes significant increase in overall white blood count um, only in the group of trained men. So it was more advantageous to be an athlete and use the sauna. The second of four conclusions, sauna bathing considerably elevates neutrophil count, basophil count, and lymphocyte count in the blood of trained men. Sauna bathing significantly causes a significantly higher increase in white blood count in monocytes in athletes compared to untrained subjects. And lastly, changes in the white blood cell profile suggest a faster mobilization of cells in the first line of immune defense in athletes compared to untrained subjects after a sauna bathing session sauna bathing could be recommended for athletes as a means of enhancing immunological defense so anyway very interesting that it was not as advantageous for the non-athletes but it was way more advantageous for the athletes and this is you know a theme i've picked out over us doing so many studies like bodies that work work better you know, that's like one of my big takeaways. Like if everything's functioning in your body, you tend to reap more benefits from the healthier things. And so it, it's not, doesn't mean you won't see anything. It's just that the athlete 
you won't see any benefit. The athlete will see greater benefit than the non-athlete in a lot of different things. I honestly believe that. Um, and so that was a very interesting takeaway, way more advantageous for, for athletes overall. Did you have any, uh, you know, <clears throat> from the conclusions, anything you took away? Um, so one thing that was pretty interesting was that, so kind of off of what you said that, um, athletes, everything kind of, you, you, everything runs a little bit better. So you're going to get a little better results. Uh, and one of them was they they lost athletes lost more body mass or plasma, I think because they, they sweat a lot more and one more of the efficiently, reasons, right? Yeah. yeah, more efficient. And that's it. And that was one of the points is that, and I, I guess I kind of already always knew, but I didn't think about it until they put it in terms of, you know, in the sauna. They lost more because their body is used to and more efficient at um, venting itself, at cooling itself. And that's why the cortisol was probably a, a bit lower because, I mean, the cortisol has started lower, but it also raised like um, raised less than the non-athletes because I think it was less of a stress to have their temperature raised and be able to cool versus non-athletes aren't used to that. So it is kind of interesting how if as long as you are, you know, putting your body through just an example of it, if you're putting your body through certain stresses, it's going to be better at the at dealing with those but also everything else just operates more efficiently uh, um overall but yeah i guess in, in the main takeaway for this even though they talked about cortisol um is just about the immune system yeah i think that they i think their conclusion actually was um where did i maybe it was in the abstract like the last line of the abstract they basically I think they kind of went in, like, you know, from the title of the study that they were looking at cortisol, but I think that they kind of walked away with the fact that uh, cortisol does not have, it, there's not a lot of correlation between cortisol and the effectiveness of a, of a sauna. And mm -hmm. originally, I think that they thought that there would be. And so their hypothesis was just kind of proven incorrect there. Um, but there was a huge difference in um, just basically how the immune system worked. And that's supposed to be one of the major benefits of a sauna is one is like, you know, detoxification, right? Just sweating. Um, when they measure people's sweat, there are a lot more heavy metals that come out um, when you do a sauna like this. Uh, but then also it's supposed to induce basically like a small fever in a human being. That's kind of what a, a sauna is doing. And so your body's reacting in the way that it gets a fever. Like, um, you know, if you, if you have kids, like the, this is a big thing, like, um, or, you know, Emily's really big on it with our kids is if they have a fever, uh, she lets it ride. Like she wants them to have a fever unless it were to become unbearable or like they're in a lot of pain, but a fever is advantageous or if it got out of control. Right. But I think the response used to be, or at least maybe with my parents, when I was a kid, it was just like, shove me full of like, Tylenol or Motrin or like whatever to just make sure I don't have a fever because it was seen as like fever is bad and and everyone's a little bit different. This is just just my upbringing, right? But uh, fevers are a good thing, and so the sauna inducing a fever is a, is a good thing. And I think if you can do it more frequently, that's awesome. But one thing I wanted to point out, and I, and I talk about this anytime we just even mention sauna, is they're specifically looking at a finished sauna here, two hundred degrees, very hot, so hot dry sauna. This is where all the research is done. Like when people ask, you know, uh, ask me any questions about like, hey, why did you get the barrel sauna? Like, why did you do? This is the answer because I've looked at a lot of the research and heat seems to be everything, seems to be why these things work. So I know there are a lot of people with infrared saunas and, you know, some of these things, they might get up to like, 120 or 140 and then you got the red light like i get it it's good and i'm sure there are a ton of benefits and there's some also some separate studies that prove the effectiveness of those i'm not saying you wasted your money i'm sure there's still benefit um, for everyone who might have one of those but the overwhelming benefit in research is in favor of saunas that are high temperature like 200 degrees 180 degrees 170 degrees is about the lowest threshold i've seen in the uh, research of being effective for a lot of a lot of different things so definitely something uh to to factor in if you're thinking about getting a sauna you want to get hot and you want to get really freaking hot uh to get a lot of the benefits from a sauna i do wish i had regular access to a sauna yeah i mean i think you know there's there's heat and cold exposure right um i'm not as sold having looked at a lot of the research on cold exposure being that advantageous like i think that it's I think it's definitely helpful and 
but I'm but I'm when I'm comparing the two, I think that heat exposure is is way greater because I think the level of cold, um, it has to be really freaking cold, like m so uncomfortable that people just aren't willing to do it, right? Like we're talking about just above freezing temperatures, or even if it's like moving water, extremely cold and for longer durations than you'd like. So when we're talking about a cold plunge at like 50 degrees, you might have to stay in there for like 15 minutes to get the benefits that you want. And people aren't typically doing that, you know, and so, and then to lower that by almost 20 degrees to stay in at five minutes, this just really, really sucks. So I think it's, I think there is a benefit to cold exposure, but I think it's harder to, to get there. And, um, I think it's humans are, we're just better with heat, you know, like we're, we're more, uh, geared for being able to handle high temperatures. We can cool ourselves off, uh, through sweating and breathing. Um, and we can't warm ourselves up as well. So I think the, the sauna is way more advantageous. I guess cold would be more for like either soft tissue joint, uh, you know, blood flow type things, because it would somewhat remove the blood from there to bring it to flush it with more. Um, I guess why some people have, have used it and, and that sort of like recovery rehab versus, you know, this sort of immune response is a, a little bit, you know, deeper internal th mechanisms. Yeah. And then if all you're looking for is blood flow, then you just get on a stationary bike and you can, you know, get away from the cold altogether. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, I'm trying to not sell people on a cold plunge and sell them on a sauna. Ultimately, <laughs> if you're, if you're looking to, even though you have both, even though I have both, uh, well, I wasted my money on one. No, I'm kidding. Uh, yeah, I mean, I enjoy it. And, uh, a lot of the cold, factor i enjoy the like the mental benefit after the fact um well, i'd say i did it's not that i don't enjoy it anymore i just don't get it anymore it's like when you drink a cup of coffee every day it's just like kind of normal right and so uh, i think when you first start doing cold exposure there's like this mental clarity and like it really wakes you up and then after you've done it for a while it's really just almost nothing it's just like yep i got in cold water i got out of cold water i'm cold now i'm warming up good to go like it's not there's not a lot of uh mental benefit to it after that um but cool i think that that concludes the study it do a sauna it's really good for you there's also a lot more research i think um great place to go um dr Rhonda patrick um she runs a website and podcast called found my fitness uh, if you go to her website i think it's foundmyfitness.com um she has a bunch of different topics uh, that she's done a lot of research on and sauna is one of them. So if you go to topics on her website, you can uh, check out sauna and then you can read all about like the different temperature and mechanisms and all that kind of stuff. So if you do want to dive further, she's got some great resources on it. Uh, let's uh, get into the workout, man. What's the workout for this week? Uh, we have fat and sugar. <laughs> so a lot of energy systems on this one. It would be beneficial if you had a all right, monitor to use that. There's a way there's a version for it, but, um, so you will do follow, do repeat the following circuit, eight minutes of zone two row run bike or bike run walk, whatever zone two is 70 to 60, 70% of your max heart rate. Then after eight minutes for two minutes, you will do zone four. So skipping zone three or greater burpee pull up. So after you finish your zone, um, two, you'll jump right into uh, pun intended, burpee pull-ups for two minutes and uh you will do that you will repeat that circuit until you accumulate 100 burpee pull-ups so however long to give a tally for your two minute reps and then obviously after you finish those that two minute section you'll go back to zone two for eight minutes so on and so forth um competitors should you should wear a 20 pound vest and then once you hit that 100 burpee pull-up mark you will take a five minute recovery period to do some math check out you might have to you know um like you're wearing a tracker you might have to actually stop your workout and let it process so you can see the time that you spent outside of zone two four or five so zone three or so and so one, one or three for every minute you spent in the zone one or three you will do 10 uh, burpees no vest i believe yeah not a lot on this one other than Get there, get into the zones as fast as you can. Um, you know, one thing we like to say is utilize breathing when you're switching in between zones to try and lower your heart rate if um, that's not something you've mastered yet. Like, I think that's a 
it's a, a great trick to at least try. Um, but I think getting up to a higher zone in a short amount of time is also good practice to like figure out, um, you know, what the required effort is. And sometimes you can overshoot that. I think if you're, um, newer to heart rate training, you got to realize that there's, there's lag within the body. There's like your body catching up and there's lag within the thing, reading your heart rate. And then, you know, there's lag between not e like it showing you, like if you're wearing a heart rate strap that's connected to the watch and then the watch is, you know, looking at it, just know, like you need to, you need to go off feel a little bit more than just uh, the data that you see on your watch or whatever. Um, if you feel like you're at max, you probably are at max. Just wait for everything to catch up. It will. And, and don't think that you need to go harder. Just, you need to find like that sustainable, uncomfortable, high heart rate zone, as opposed to just like going max and, and make sure you have a good heart rate monitor for this one. That's another thing is, I mean, I get incredibly frustrated with heart rate monitors. Like, I think I've just like broken some on purpose before out of frustration, um, depending on like the activity. I mean, this was, I was much younger, long, long time ago. It's been several weeks, um, since I broke a heart rate monitor. Uh, so yeah, you just, you, you need to factor in those kind of things when you're getting into different heart rate zones and then use some breathing to, to calm down. That's about all the tips I have for, for that one. Yeah. Um, for the zone two part, I mean, it's zone two is zone two. It seems like that's just, it's set cause you're, you're set at your intensity, but I would say probably if you can use a bike because it's not going to be as demanding so that when you go to your burpee pull-ups, you can probably push harder and do a couple more reps each two minute set versus if you're going on a run, you might be going down to a walk, especially because you have the vest on or putting the vest on that little bit of time change. Most likely you're going to want to keep it on anyway. Um, if we were on a vest on a bike, you're just wearing a vest on a bike. It doesn't really matter, but it's going to add more to, it's going to stress your body more on a run than it will on a bike. And so, you know, it might, it might matter to like three to five reps per two minutes, which could add up to like a, an entire other set of eight minutes of zone two to do the finish last couple reps. Awesome. So get it done. Uh, all right, we'll roll into, uh, some updates for life updates. How you doing, Joe? How, like you excited about 2023? Ready to, ready to crush another year? A little bit. Uh, things are getting, th th things are changing a little bit. I, uh, so back in June, if you didn't, didn't know, I hurt my back. So I took time off from the barbell. I went to body weight and then eventually to some kettlebell. So now I'm back on the barbell. So that's exciting. I definitely missed it. And I've been glad to be back on it, but I'm still doing PT and recovery stuff. I'm still not fully healed. I just don't want to spend more time away from the barbell. So weight wise, especially on squats, I'm sticking pretty light right now. And even like day one of squats, I kind of like back flared a little bit for a couple of days, but it's pretty much fine now. Um, and then so doing all my PT stuff to, and it's, it's, you know, very slow going and just monitoring that, but it's still nice to, to be lifting. Uh, and, but then also like I have an ankle thing going on, so I can't run all the time, which I, I which if, if I, if I just had to avoid some squats, it's okay. I'd run more, but I can't run a ton. So now there's just balancing like between injuries and different things that I can do trying to, to, to be smart, but still getting good workouts and still working, trying to work out hard because I don't just want to, I feel like the last couple of months because of injuries and stuff, I just kind of coasted and I don't really want to do that anymore. So trying to find that happy range of putting through effort, but also not setting myself back on injury wise. You know, I, I think I've taken enough time off like resting. So now I just need to do the PT heal and then work with what I got to still be able to to work out hard. So it's going going okay so far. There's still some some little pains here and there, but I think it's, it's slowly <clears throat> getting a bit better. Uh, I did a run this past weekend and I felt completely fine. You know, I'm starting to feel a little bit of the new, you know, muscles that, that I've been working on for PT to help balance out what my ankle issue is. So that's, that, that's a uh, positive that it's already kind of, kind of working. So it'll just be, just be a little slow going, but that's kind of what I'm starting off with, you know, jumping back on the barbell, back on strength track, because I just like the simplicity of it. And it's just kind of how I've liked to do my workouts. Now I like kind of sometimes boring, simple in a way, like I have my strength days, I like to have my conditioning days. 
and that'd be that. So that way I can focus on if I, if I want to, whenever I can run, I can sub out something for a run day because I, I need to start uh, running more in general. Cause I just haven't much. Yeah. About you? Uh, I mean, well, I'd say you're doing all the right things. Cause I did the opposite of that when I hurt my back. Um, <laughs> like every time my back just felt like slightly better, I'd be like, okay, great. Heavy back squats. And, uh, you know, that, that didn't go well. I just kept repeating the same cycle. So I finally took it easy and then recovered and, and I'm good now. I mean, I, things have been, I mean, to be honest, things have been great. I've been feeling great. I've been running a ton more. Um, I I'm actually, I'm operating a little bit outside the programming even just cause I feel like I have <clears throat> catch up to do on, um, uh, getting some of my aerobic base back. That's what, um, that's where I was the, the lagging the most and, and things are catching up slowly. Like last night I ran, um, so when I, when I got hurt, my, I didn't run at all. And it's funny that we both hurt our lower back, but like I stopped running altogether and I just did row stuff. And I've talked about this on the podcast, but the transition back to running has actually been really rough. And when I first started, when I was doing zone two runs, my zone two mile pace was like somewhere between 13 and 14 minutes. It was like 13, 1330 per mile would be like a solid uh, zone two run. That's basically a walk. And it's just, that was crazy for me because I was always like sub 10 for zone two. And last night was the first time I've kind of gotten back to it. Like I got back to, um, I think I finished last night's run. It was about a 40 minute run um, at around a 950 uh, pace uh, for, for several miles uh, or like, three and a half close to four miles, something like that. And so it's just encouraging to see how quickly it's coming back. Cause it's only been a little over a month. Right. And so I went from like 13 down to sub 10. And so that's how you can tell it's not like this massive, like actually being out of shape. It's just actually conditioning to the, the, the event itself, like actually running my body wasn't accustomed to it, but I've been running a ton more, um, doing a lot of two a days. So I'm doing a lot of like strength work in the afternoon and running in the evenings. And, uh, it's been good. I feel great and, and ready to just keep tackling, uh, tackling that, uh, into the, into the new year. Are you doing true zone two or math? Uh, math. I don't, I don't even know if I believe in true zone two. Like, I think, I think math is the true zone two. Like, I actually think true zone two is, fake like it's so um this might be opposite for you you probably have the opposite of opinion because your heart rate's so low um all the time but i feel like i because i did zone two for a i mean i've been doing it for a long time like several several years this isn't like a new thing and true proper zone two was so slow like it was so stupid slow and some people might be like, yeah, well, that's what it is. Zone two, you have to go slow. You have to get used to it. But I'm talking like it was really slow and I can run in math zone two. I can still hold a conversation. I can do nasal only breathing and my heart rate can be at like 147, 150. And that's where my math zone two is at. So yeah, I, uh, I definitely do math. I don't, um, I actually don't know if I'd ever do any zone two in my true zone two. Um, yeah, I feel like true that's zone two. It's because it's such a narrow window. You could go up like you could just you could be running flat and then go up a driveway and then you're out like even just walking like just, like five beats could just get you out of it versus math. You've got another 20 beats to go. So like ish, depending on what your what yours is. So, yeah, I would probably still agree with that. I, I can hold the, like my math zone too for a pretty long time. Um, I just did what was it condition me to the grave i got through the hundreds and the mile and like i was on the second row before i broke into zone three like outside of math zone two um which i which i kind of wanted to stick that way anyway but like running wise i just did zone two back on sunday right like with, with the stroller and the run and my pacing was still it was slower than normal but it wasn't like egregiously bad i, I can still maintain decent math zone two i can i still feel like i'm going somewhere versus if i were to choose true zone two it like I just feel like I wouldn't get that much out of it. Like even, even sweating. Like I feel like I wouldn't even sweat very much if I did that. Yeah. I, I mean, true zone two would probably be walking. And now Garmin's got these power, 
power zones, which I'm like super yeah. interested in. I'm like, damn it, I gotta figure out a new thing. Yeah, because I literally kind of... when I started my run, it was like, do you want to track power? I said yes, okay. And then I I didn't look at it more, but I was like, okay, I don't know what what I'm gonna use this for, but I think I would love to, especially for like sprints. Well, yeah, because if I keep it lower zone two, math zone two, even it says my power is in zone one, and I'm like, hmm, because oh, I the most comfortable I feel is in zone three. Like that's okay. where I feel like I could. It's a faster pace. I could hold it for still very long duration. Uh, and so, and I think that's zone, my math zone three is probably my power zone two. Um, but I haven't played around with it enough or even done enough research to know exactly what they're talking about. I know when I done, have done sprint workouts, my, my power is like way higher. It goes up quite a bit. Say, are there, are there power zones? I'm looking at my power for my run now and just how it's, it's fairly consistent, but it would be, I would be interested to see how it is like, I, I, it definitely will correlate with pace because um, like almost like not quite directly, but my power is like higher than the first half and the second half. Um, my pace gets a little bit slower. So yeah, I would be, it'll be kind of interesting to see what they're, what they're doing with power and what to, what to make of it. Armin, some good equipment. Yeah. We're not sponsored by him, but uh, definitely check them out. <laughs> You got any events you want to do this year? Anything else you, you have going on? Um, I would at, like as to usual. do at least. I would like to do one or two events, um, especially because we can get like some athletes or the team to go. It's just deciding which ones to do. I always, I still have uh, issues with with doing the Spartans, like traditional regular Spartans, and just kind of over them. So there's some other cool ones. It's just finding out the time of um, if I can do them for you know opening um, schedule wise, and then like running most most of the events are going to involve a lot of running but mostly some of them are going to be trail running but i need to actually be able to a run without any pain and be able to recover fine and not just like stress my body too much not not to not go full david goggins on it or um and also like actually perform decently and like enjoy it so focus on re recovery first and when I, can, when I can get some good running days in and, and getting back to to um fully full capacity there that's when I'll, I'll schedule something out and it'll probably um so yeah we'll see but let's just do a marathon one. yeah hurt just yeah, see if i can push through no no no. i mean recover a little bit <laughs> do a marathon no no that's like i would i did a, i did a half marathon once and I, I signed up the week before and it was fine it was like it was on a deployment and it was like you know deployment scenery so it was probably one of the shittier half marathons you could do and i did okay i would do a, the only way, way i would do a full marathon if it was in like a cool place like getting good scenery it, it'll be a, an enjoyable time a weekend i'm not just gonna be like i'm not just gonna go to the track one day and run a marathon i wouldn't do it again <laughs> uh yeah i feel like um I, I, that's where i'm leading leaning towards events not necessarily i mean it could be marathon i don't know but real events because uh, i kind of feel similar like same way to as you like i just i've never really been that into spartans like we do them but we do them because of like what you just said on the back half of like why you would do a marathon like i'll do a spartan because i can do them in really cool spots like we can do them on top of a mountain in Asheville, north carolina or like wherever in colorado or um they have one in montana this year that i had my eye on just like beautiful places and that's the only reason I'm even interested in doing them. But other than that, I don't find a lot of enjoyment. Um, or I don't know. It's just, it's weird. You know, I'm just not, I'm not that into them either. Like, I just think yeah. that you have to experience them there. They just are what they are, but um, they're still fun. Still fun to like do in, in certain circumstances. Uh, I think but, you would like, uh, we, we did one a while back called uh, Cirque Series. It's like a mountain race. Um, you know, the fit people, especially that are uh, altitude uh, uh, acclimatized, are can run it. We basically did a, did a fast hike for the entire time. But th that's the biggest factor is because they are pretty much on top of mountains. They take over ski resorts and you're basically running up the ski resort thing and then back down. Um, so a lot of elevation. That was the hardest part because we, we were doing, we came from San Diego and we did it in uh, it was a Arapaho Basin in Colorado, and it was like above 10, 12,000 feet that you eventually get up to. And it sucked, but uh, it was a really cool race because 
you still see like fantastic scenery. You're literally going on top of a mountain looking around and then you go down. And when you finish the final, like wrap up party is actually at the ski resort. So you're not like in a mud field in the middle of nowhere, getting stuck and like trying to figure out how to hose yourself off. You're just like, Hey, cool. You're there. There's food, there's drink. There's a ton of giveaways. It was, it was pretty cool. I would probably do one again that, um, the altitude is the, the hardest part, but having now done, uh, Kilimanjaro dealing with that altitude, I feel like I could find some ways to at least help a little bit, but there's only so much you could do without actually being at altitude, but they're still enjoyable. Yeah. That, uh, reminds me of one of the events I want to do is, uh, we've talked about it before is the Everesting 29, 0, 29 thing. You want to make up your own Everesting, which I still, I still uh, push back on, but well, you you brought up a good point to that one was the, uh, the, down. the eccentric like the, yeah. the down and once you brought that up i was like good point you don't have to you shouldn't have to do that i mean i guess you have to come down everest technically if you climb it right you don't in uh the everesting portion of it but the so are they doing the top of everest or to base camp so what th- this is similar to what you were saying they they just rent out um ski resort yeah, ski resort. Vermont, so yeah. it's called 290.29everesting.com if anybody wants to check it out. Tickets are expensive. They're like $5,000. Um, so that is but, the peak. Okay. Because that's the altitude. Yeah, they have Whistler, Snow Basin, Jackson Hole, Sun Valley. So not even like ski resorts. They're like the expensive ski resorts. Um, and then you, yeah, you go, you go up the top and it might be like 6000 feet or something like that and then you ride a gondola down and then you do it again until you hit that you know close to thirty thousand feet and that one i'm i'm interested in doing because it's just like more my style it's just like a grind like i don't even think they i don't even think they track like they don't really care when you finish or who finished first it's you know it's just a personal thing for everybody yeah and that's why i'm there most of the time it's rarely like a competition type thing so i think that's a cool event that uh, I mean, to be honest, it looks like they pretty much sold out. Uh, so maybe I could do in 2024, but not this year. Oh, one's open for Snow Basin. It's like the crappiest location. I watched maybe. some tra- some YouTubers um, do it. Like they, they had an old video on them doing it. It looked, it looked pretty wild. It looked pretty cool. Um, and it's something that I would be interested to try. And um, they do... So when you come down, I think it was like, I don't know, like 19 or whatever laps up the up the ski resort, depending on where you're at. And you come back to mark your laps. They they brand this piece of wood. Yeah. You brand your thing. And it's pretty cool. I think it would be um, you call it a bucket list event. That would be fun to do, especially with people. Um, I know it's very expensive, though. That'd That's be hard to like with a person. Event. Maybe you're not getting a you're not getting a team of 15. I was going to say like. Hey, 2025, <laughs> everybody starts saving up. <laughs> yeah. Because I think you also get a tent area to like l- relax in if you if you need to in between, you know, get a little mid- midway break. Yeah, because they have like the pay in full for tent for two is $12,000. <laughs> Why does it get more expensive? It's $5,000 for one ticket. Then if you buy two, it's 12000 Like that's, <laughs> wow, that's that not is... normally how companies work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. buying more of something <laughs> they're like oh you want two it's more money like okay I'll, never mind i'll just buy two separate tickets you guys are math uh, this wrong yeah. <laughs> uh but that's one i would love to do i don't think i'll do it this year but maybe i can i can start training i know uh mark bishop and i don't know if ryan caswell is doing it with him we mentioned it before they're doing stairway to heaven <laughs> um weekly yeah every week so i mean they would be primed for an event like this there we go but, uh, yeah <laughs> Put it on the list. Put it on the yep. list. Uh, but that's it. You know, um, a lot of updates coming. Uh, we're kind of working on a lot of stuff behind the scenes, you know, just for all the garage gym athletes out there. A lot of little things. I kind of mentioned it in one of the uh, podcasts, end of the year, beginning of the year, and gave you guys some updates. In January, this month is the month that you can kind of see some of that stuff coming to life. So we'll have emails coming out, um, putting posts in the Facebook group, all of those kind of things. So just be on the lookout for all of that should be launching the next couple of weeks, the things that we do have coming out, like the new community and, and all that stuff. So just keep an eye out. And for all of our, uh, you know, athletes, thanks for, for sticking around and, and being part of the community. And as we go through some changes, you know, bear with us, 
we want it to be as smooth as possible, but I'm sure there'll be some unforeseen hiccups. Um, so we just appreciate your patience there. If anybody's looking to get started, go to garagegymathlete.com. You can sign up for a free trial. Uh, but that's it for this one, guys. Remember, if you don't kill comfort, comfort will kill you. Athlete Podcast. If you want to learn more, go to garagegymathlete.com. You can learn about our training. Let us send you a copy of our book, The Garage Gym Athlete, or you can even get featured on the Garage Gym Athlete Podcast. Thanks for listening.